Here we go. Welcome to the 928th meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. And I really appreciate everyone coming tonight. It's going to be a, a great night. We've got a great topic and a great speaker. Uh, if you missed dinner, and I know most of you did, we, we had a fantastic time. And the one thing that, that really struck home, we had a discussion about science and music. And I asked the question, well, who, who plays an instrument? Who's a musician here? So I thought I'd ra have everyone raise their hand that has, was forced to play an instrument growing up or is an avid musician now. And if you raise your hand, I really appreciate it. How about those that pretend to? Well, that, that counts too, right? Yeah, it's a pretty good number. I'm, I'm always impressed when I think about how science, math, uh, and music, art, all comes together. And we had a great discussion about art too, so that was really cool. Um, so next month, if you're hungry, we have a great meal down at House of Chang. House of Chang. Uh, so feel free to come next time, 6 o'clock. We had a great time and uh, look forward to seeing you there. Um, so without any more ado, we're going to go through our little agenda. So I want to welcome you all. My name is Tom McDonough. I'm the president of Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. I got dressed up for you guys. But, um, uh, any any uh, guests or new members here tonight? Well, well, welcome aboard. Yeah, welcome aboard. Really appreciate it. Hopefully you enjoy it. Um, and we meet here once a month, except for August. I'm on my sailboat. Um, <laughs> so uh, please, you're welcome anytime. And we have a great group of speakers coming through June, and we're working on September <coughs> on also. And so without any more ado, um, Secretary's report, and Glenn's going to fill in for John today. Uh, time spent with two billion year old photons is potent stuff. I like some of these quotations I get off the internet. That's a good one. I'm saving the next moon one for when uh, Mario comes back. I guess he's going to be missing the next two meetings. Okay, we'll go ahead and next. A lot of things happening, especially for you visual observers. Mars, Saturn, and uh, let's see, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are lined up in the morning sky, and the moon's going to be going past them the next couple of mornings. So on Tuesday, the 18th, Big one here, we're going to have an occultation of the planet Mars. And it starts at 7.39 to 9.05, that's approximate. That was for Boston, so it depends on where you are. There might be a minute or so difference. Now the problem we have is that happens after sunrise. But you'll be able to guide yourself by the moon. Now how many of you saw that uh, occultation of Venus by a crescent moon a couple of, I guess a couple of winters ago now? I remember it was getting hard to see the moon toward the end of the because in the afternoon it was that crescent, morning crescent moon actually setting down in the afternoon ahead of the sun, so it, it was kind of hard to see them. This shouldn't be too bad because the moon will be in the morning sky. The sky will still be kind of, it won't be as hazy as it gets later in the day, so you probably want to get up, you probably want to set up well before that time, so if you have a hard time finding the moon, you can look for it. What I did back then was I had a little astro scan with a wide field of view, and I was able to just search that area until I found the moon, and then I was good to go. Uh, it should take a couple of minutes for the moon to cover Mars, and then about an hour and a half or so later, Mars will reappear. And again, this is all in the morning sky. The folks in the western part of the country get to see the whole thing in darkness. Uh, the next night, or the next morning, on the 19th, uh, the moon's going to pair up with Jupiter. Again, this is in the southeast sky. And then the following morning, it'll be uh, with Saturn. And that one you might have to get up a little earlier because it's going to be fairly, that moon's going to be very thin and close to the rising sun. So that'll be the toughest of the one to put. And that's why I put a half hour rather than 45 minutes. Uh, February 21st is Betelgeuse Day of uh, Reckoning. And I'm not quite sure. That was off of space weather. Apparently, if you haven't heard, uh, Belgius has done a nose drive. It's not even a first magnitude star anymore. It was about the 10th brightest star a couple months ago. Now it's somewhere around 25th. And uh, I'll talk about this in just a few minutes because I've been watching the star. But sometimes it's predicted when a star, red supergiant, goes supernova, it's going to drop like that and then there'll be all hell is going to break loose. And for some reason, the February 21st, there's a bunch of cycles that this star goes through. It's an irregular variable, and apparently all these things add together. And as I understand, if this star continues to fade, supposedly it might start to rebound around the 21st. If it continues to dip, then they want to take a close look at this star. It could go supernova. 
It could happen any time within the next 100,000 years, which is a finger snap as far as the cosmos is concerned. Of course, for us, our great-great-great-grandchildren might not see this event. But you never know, so keep a watch on that. Of course, Orion's right in the evening sky, you can't miss it. But how many of you have noticed how really faint uh, or, uh, Al, uh, yeah, Al Debron. Um, Betelgeuse has looked lately. It's, it's <laughs> remarkable. It doesn't look that much brighter than some of the other stars in that particular area. Oh, what else do we have? The moon's going to pair up with Venus. That's in the western sky on Thursday, February 27th, right after sunset. Eastern daylight time begins on March 8th. We all hate that because now we have to start an hour later. It screws up star parties because especially if you have little kids, you have to now wait an hour later to start the star party. And of course, that only gets worse as you get into April and May. So if you're planning star parties for the kids, you might think about doing it as soon as you can or maybe during March while the sunsets are still reasonably uh, early enough. And finally, 30 minutes after sunset on March 8th, Venus and Uranus are going to be about two degrees apart. So you should look for them with binoculars. And certainly with a small telescope, and even large telescope, use some high power. So those are the events going on uh, between now and the next meeting. Go to the next. Just fried my computer. Okay. Uh, the observer's challenge for this month is NGC 1931. It's an emission reflection nebula in Auriga. And I did check it out a couple of weeks ago, and it looks a lot like the one we had last month, 1999. If you remember, 1991 was a nebula that had a star implanted near its center. This is the same thing, although it's not a star, it's actually a multiple star, and sometimes it's referred to as a poor man's Orion Nebula, because it is a nebula, like the Orion Nebula, and it also has a multiple star right in its core. And uh, I found it by, well, this is the general map, it's right near um, Psi, Auriga is between that and M36, and this is a close-up chart. Uh, this is off the AABSO website. You can make your own charts there. That's M36, and there's Phi over there, or Psi rather. And what I did is I just got this field in the view so I could orient myself, and then I jumped to a pair of eighth magnitude stars, and it was right there. And again, what I saw was a fuzzy tenth magnitude star. I went to higher magnification with a 10-inch telescope, and I was able, the scene wasn't that good. I did see a double star. And what you're supposed to be able to see is actually a triple star. There are three stars that they're 11th, yeah, 11th, 12th, and 13th magnitudes of the three stars. They form almost an equilateral triangle. And again, they're about eight arc seconds separate each one. Then there's a 14th magnitude star that you can pick. That completes the trapezium. That 14th magnitude star is a real bugger to see. So if you want to see the detail, that you probably want to wait for a night when the stars aren't twinkling, the air is kind of steady, you'll be able to pick that out. Okay, next. And these are pictures, one from Doug Paul. Uh, Doug, this is yours right here, right? Yes. And there's Mario's. And again, the, the triple, I think it almost, from where I'm seeing, I see stars here. That might be it. It's kind of hard sometimes with these exposures. That's why I always promote sketching. Because when you're sketching, you can see the, the trapezium in your eye and everything. When you take an image, sometimes that's washed out. So I, I like to look and see these things with the eye myself. Uh, next. I did a little bit of variable star observing myself. I'm going to talk about that at another time. But there's a light curve at the top for Betelgeuse. Of course, the gaps are because at that time the sun's in the way. And this is for a three-year period. And you can see it pretty much bounces around 5 tenths of a magnitude, 0.5. It'll go, and I'll tell you, the one I like, I don't know if you can see it. You see that one? We, have, we don't have a pointer, do we? Yes, we do. Yes. Hold on, I have a pointer. Oh, OK, here. About the light. Hey, Tom. Oh, Tom. Tom, about the light. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> now, you've been here for two years. You should be able to do this. It took me three to finally figure that out. There we go. Ain't technology great? We used to have light switches in the old days. I'm wondering about that person right there. Because that's 1.6 when it was still up here. My thought is that. Either this person is totally daft, or he can see the future. I have no idea. But I've, no, I've made observations myself. And you can get on the AAVSO website and get a light curve like that. You can even have yours pointed out. And uh, if I saw that with a crosshair over it, I know that's me. I'd get that thing erased as soon as I could. But look at the plunge right here. This was literally last fall. It was still around 0 0.5, and then kaboom. 
it dropped like a rock. And one person here even had it second magnitude. I haven't seen it for a couple of nights now, but the last time I had it about 1.6, 1.7. It's the faintest it's been in a long time, but it has had a couple dips over the past century, so it's gone down to about 1.5. So this is not unusual, but as far as recent times, it's unprecedented. The bottom, uh, Algol had an eclipse, and I was telling you folks that I was gonna let you know about it. I didn't. Turns out that that was, a, uh, don't let Mario know I told you this, but it was a full moon night and the moon got in the way. But Beta Persei, Algol, goes from about second magnitude, 2.2 down to about 3.4 and back. The entire cycle takes eight hours. But you can see the guts of it in about four to five hours. And when I started, it was already about 2.5, and it was dropping about a tenth of a magnet or so every 15 minutes. These are 15 minute intervals. And I watched it go all the way down to about 3.2. This area was tough because the full moon was out, and I, was, I had to look with averted vision to see this third magnitude star. That's how bright the skies were. Again, Mario, I didn't say this, so don't tell Mario, but it was a problem. And then the stars slowly started to rise. At about the time, I wanted to catch it going all the way back up to 2.2. But in this area, uh, the, co the constellation and the comparison star started to hide behind the trees, so I just wasn't able to see the finish of the eclipse. But I do want to do this one time with the club. It's good that I didn't. Not only was the moon a problem, but Perseus really was already getting kind of low in the sky. If we do this, I'd want to do it sometime in November or December when Perseus is nicely placed and it'll be visible the whole time of the eclipse. We did one. A number of years ago. Anybody here that did that one? I don't know if John Reed did. Some of you did at that time. So we'll do it again. I think, let's see all of the others. There's one other thing, I think. Yeah. Oh, it's not up there. There was a thing about the uh, Messier Marathon. Don't recall what you said. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, that's all right. Well, it's in the newsletter in the, under the uh, clubhouse. That's where I schedule. saw it. I put, I put a slide here for it as well. I sent, I sent you a separate thing. Maybe you had the other one. Okay, who was it that organized that? Anyway, we have a Messier Marathon at the club uh, right around this time of year when you can see, it's one night where you can see most, if not all, of the Messier objects. And the prime time is around mid-March. That's the best time to see them all. Um, but this year, that's going to be around full moon. So the first weekend is coming up. And anybody here that's done a Messier Marathon before? Yeah, I think most of us know it's mini marathon time. I did do a couple. I got 99 one year, and I wanted to get that 100. I was struggling like crazy because it's getting brighter. And I went for M15, the globular cluster in, uh, in uh, Pegasus. I just couldn't see it. But I'm, there's no way I'm ever going to do one of those things again. It is a grind. I did the Boston Marathon one time. I did the Messier Marathon. The Messier Marathon was harder than the Boston Marathon. It's a lot of time being on your feet. You know, the, the Boston Marathon took me maybe five hours because I'm a crummy runner. A Messier Marathon is an all-night deal, but you do get some breaks. And does anybody have any questions, comments, before I turn everything back over to Tom? All right, thank you very much, and keep looking up. I want to take an opportunity to welcome Dr. Roseanne Stefano. I don't know if I say that correctly, if I should. Stefano. Stefano. Um, she's an astronomer at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and she works in theory of binary and triplet systems, including those producing type 1A supernovae and gravitational mergers. And I'll stop right there and let her get going. And um, hopefully you all enjoy it. And Take uh, 45 minutes and okay. some questions, things like that. Um, and so everyone will be attentive, I am sure. to say thank you to Eileen again for bringing refreshments, if I forget, at the end. Oh, okay. Well, um, when I started getting ready for the talk, after having prepared it last week, I realized that this title is really quite a mouthful. Uh, it's got hierarchical triples, it has gravitational mergers, it has type 1A supernovae. 
So I, I hope you'll forgive me for being so wordy, but there's actually a lot that I wanted to tell you about, and so it was maybe uh, too much enthusiasm. So let's start unpacking this a little bit. And I'll start with the idea of hierarchical triples. So the first thing to keep in mind, in fact, the only thing to keep in mind, is that in a hierarchical <coughs> triple, you have a binary. And whatever the radius or semi-major axis of this binary is, the companion to the binary, which is gravitationally bound to it, and they are orbiting each other, this companion needs to be at least three times farther away from the center of mass of the binary uh, than these members of the binary are to each other. Uh, if you didn't have that, the binary, the, the triple system would not be stable. Uh, one of the stars would be ejected. If you tried to take this star and bring it in closer to the others, one of the three would be ejected or perhaps two of them would merge and you'd be left with a binary again, or perhaps all three of them would merge and you'd be left with a single star. So it's the condition of stability that makes these triples be hierarchical, and when you see triples in the sky, you should see this type of system. Now, we in astronomy who are doing uh, research on the formation of things, like type 1 and supernovae, are getting more and more interested in triples and even higher order multiples. So you can see how you'd make a higher order multiple here, or how nature might do it, if you took this star and turned it into a binary. Then you'd have what is essentially a hierarchical quadruple, right? And you can keep going with this, right? You can uh, it, take this separation, but put something in a very small separation around one of these, or around both of them, and you're building potentially stable hierarchical systems. So today we're going to keep it relatively simple and stay with the hierarchical triple. At its heart is a binary. And as you know, binaries are common. In fact, you were just talking about Algol, which is one of the historically most famous binaries in the, in the sky, because even in ancient times, it was noticed that Algol was highly variable. It got brighter and dimmer. Uh, people described it like the blinking of an eye. It was referred to as the devil's head, the ghoul's head. You now people were a little nervous about this, this star, which we now know is a pair of stars. Uh, I believe that Rukba is also a binary star. I think it may be an eclipsing binary. Gamma Cassiopeia has at least three components, one of which is a spectroscopic binary. Epsilon Persei is a binary, but may also be a triple. And I think Mirfak has been suggested to have a planet, although I don't know if that suggestion has been proved or disproved. So the presence of binaries and even of triples in the sky is common. Now that's an interesting fact, right? You can tell your friends, OK, well, point up at some star, something that looks like a star in the sky, and large fraction of the time, it's actually a multiple system. But what makes these systems most interesting to me is that the binaries, it's not just that they're in an orbit with each other, but that a significant fraction of them get to interact with each other. In this case, we have uh, one star which is clearly giving mass to another. This is an artist's conception, of course. And we see that this star has a kind of a teardrop shape. It may be filling its roche lobe. And here we have an accretion disk around the companion, which may be a white dwarf, a neutron star, a black hole. And we have jets that are being ejected from the central region, generally perpendicular to the disk. So binary systems like this, are associated with many of the variable systems that we see. So for example, cataclysmic variables, uh, I'm sure how many of you have studied CVs, cataclysmic variables? OK, it's one of the most common types of variables in the sky. It's a, a white dwarf, so the remnant of a star like the sun, 
that's accreting matter from a low mass stellar companion. Algol like systems, taking their name from Algol itself, another very common type of interacting binary. We believe that type 1a supernovae, which I'll be discussing more in a few minutes, are also derived from binaries. And they are responsible for, for enriching the interstellar medium uh, with iron that can then be used in later generations of stars. And uh, today, one of the most interesting types of events we're studying are mergers, where we might have black holes that merge with each other, neutron stars, or even black holes and neutron stars together. So without binaries, we wouldn't have these phenomena. And in fact, it has been said that 80% of all phenomena of interest to astronomers today are due to binaries. Uh, now often, the accretor of interest is the end state of stellar evolution. So let's just take a quick look at this uh, diagram. Uh, which I just pulled off the web. You start with star formation, and for stars about as massive as our sun, or even up to eight or nine times as massive, they're going to go through a giant phase, and as a planetary nebula, and the central star in the nebula becomes a white dwarf. So this is an object about as massive as the sun, in a volume about as big as the Earth's. And if you have more massive stars, then you also go through a giant phase, a red supergiant phase, supernova, and then become a neutron star or a black hole. And we're going to be interested in, in these end states right there. Now Sirius, of course, is one of the most famous uh, systems in the sky. Sirius A is a two solar mass star. Sirius B is a solar mass white dwarf. And uh, again, this is, I'm sure you guys know a lot more about this than I do, actually. <laughs> I have to tell you, you, you invited a theorist to give you a talk, and so your knowledge, your deep knowledge of the sky is going to be far, uh, <laughs> far deeper and more extensive than mine. But this is a star that even I know, Sirius, and this is a constellation that I think uh, most people say that they know, whether, even if they're not uh, into astronomy. Now here's Algol. Algol was famous because of being the ghoul star, the devil's head. But among astronomers, it's famous because of the so-called Algol paradox. We think that most binaries, the stars are born together, born at the same time. And we know that more massive stars tend to evolve more quickly. They become giants and then remnants earlier than their less massive companions. But Algol presented a paradox because the star that's more evolved, and that's the star that we see uh, right over here that's expanding, is actually the less massive star. Mm. Now, how did that happen? Well, it had to be through a prior episode of mass transfer. So the more massive star and the less massive star born together, the more massive star begins to expand and starts to transfer mass to the less massive star. Okay? Now this is a kind of an amazing thing because the more massive star has now become less massive. It gets to live longer. It's given mass to its companion, which now is going to act like a more massive star that should be in a younger system than this, and it's going to end its life more quickly. So that's the Algol paradox. But this is not uncommon. You saw on the other graph that there are other Algol-like stars, and many of you may have actually studied these. Now, one thing I hadn't known until recently is that Algol is not a binary. It's a triple. And the same is true of many stars. Polaris is a triple. Right? So take home is that triples are common. If you have a chance to look up the work by this guy, Topa Vinin, he is a master of studying multiple stars in the sky and identifying intriguing systems. Uh, this is my, uh, my past graduate student. He's now a postdoctoral fellow, Max Moe. And I have studied uh, binaries extensively 
to put together not a list of all the binaries, but what are the characteristics of whole populations of binaries? To essentially allow somebody to rebuild a population of realistic binaries. And Max would love being here tonight because he started his life in astronomy as an amateur with his dad driving him all around in Colorado, which is where he's from, to study the sky. And he still loves to get out there uh, and, and work with people to do uh, star parties and things like that. So what, would, what did we learn? Well, this is the one fact you might want to keep in mind. Among highly massive stars, you know, 10 solar masses or more, almost all of them are in hierarchical triples or higher order multiples. They might have more companions than there might be more than just three stars in the system. So somebody once asked, uh, somebody told me that they were, had once been asked, is there any evidence that high mass stars are in binaries? And he threw back the question. He said, is there any evidence that high mass, that there's any high mass star that's not in a binary or didn't form in a binary? And now we might say, is there any evidence that high mass stars do not form in triples? because they mostly form in these higher orbital triples. So whereas we've made our lives easy for decades by studying binaries, we now have to expand our horizons a little bit. So let me now talk about two examples where binary evolution plays a key role in causing something interesting to happen. The first type of system I want to talk about is a type 1A supernova. This is an artist's conception of what may have been the most luminous supernova seen from Earth. This was a type 1A supernova, and I'll tell you in a moment what we mean by that, um, observed in the year 1006. This was observed uh, from many parts of the world, from the Far East to the Middle East to Europe some evidence that it may have been observed in the Americas. And um, this was a type 1A. Now when we say type 1A, what we mean is something a little different from what Betelgeuse will do. Betelgeuse is a massive star. When it runs out of fuel, ultimately, it will start to collapse, there'll be an implosion, and there'll be a supernova explosion. That's the core collapse supernova that happens at the end of a star's life. A star like our sun will never go through that. It's not massive enough. It will become a giant. It will have a huge envelope. And at some point, that envelope will start to float away, leaving a hot star which evolves into a white dwarf behind. If that white dwarf doesn't have companions, it will just stay that way, and that's what we think will happen to our sun. Eventually, it will cool. But if the white dwarf has a companion, it can gain mass. Our sun, when it becomes a white dwarf, will have about half or 60% of the mass it has today. Some stars that are more massive, say seven or eight solar masses, can become white dwarfs that are about a solar mass or a little bit more than that. If a white dwarf has a companion that can donate enough mass so that the white dwarf gets to 1.4 solar masses, a value we refer to as the Chandrasekhar mass, <coughs> it will either collapse and form a neutron star, or it will become a type 1a supernova. Okay. So type 1a supernovae come from white dwarfs that have gained mass in some manner. Totally different type of supernova, first identified because there was no hydrogen in the spectrum and no helium. You know, when Betelgeuse explodes, there'll have been this envelope of hydrogen and helium that will have been blown off. When a white dwarf explodes, there's very little hydrogen and helium. And so they were identified because they didn't have the hydrogen and helium, and eventually we understood what they were. 
So this is supposed to be 10.06. In 10.59, Tycho Brahe observed a supernova that now looks like this. This is the supernova remnant. This was also a 1A. We know from the description of how it brightened and how the brightness fell. And also from looking at the supernova remnant, uh, we think this was definitely a 1A. And don't, I don't know if you know the story of uh, Tycho. How many of you know the story of uh, Tycho Brahe? Okay. He was probably one of the, I mean, he was maybe the premier astronomer of the pre-telescopic era. He took it upon himself to measure the positions of objects with unprecedented accuracy. And it was through his observations of the planets, night by night, that the paths of the planets were tracked out. And uh, Kepler, who we know through Kepler's laws, right? Kepler was his assistant. He was a mathematically oriented guy, mathematician. And Tycho died suddenly. And Kepler either was granted or took possession of Tycho's records. And he was the one who eventually was able to figure out what the orbits of the planets were. In 1604, there was a second type 1A supernova taking place you know, within one lifetime, because Kepler was really alive for both of these guys, uh, often called Kepler's supernova, although he didn't discover it. Now, this is amazing. This was 1604. Right? That was the last supernova that took place in our galaxy you know, between then and now. We don't know of any others. And wouldn't you know it, the telescope was, was used by Galileo for the first time five years later. So these supernovae just missed being observed by telescopes. <laughs> and we're still waiting for the next one. So for now, and I heard you mention this before, the, the supernovae that we observe, and in particular the type 1a supernovae, are observed in other galaxies. Now, type 1As are special not only because they're formed in a special way, but also because type 1A supernovae are all very similar to each other. People used to think they were exactly the same, and they were called standard candles. Well, we know now they're not the same, but they're so much like each other, and I'll show you a picture of a graph that shows the light curve. So this is brightness versus days after peak brightness. You can see there's a similarity here. And you can do a transformation. Uh, these are not standard candles, but they're standardizable candles. You can do a transformation that makes the light curves look like this. So what that means is that if you can see how long it takes a type 1a supernova to decline, and I'll go back to the other picture just to remind you of this. See how long it takes to decline. That tells you what the peak luminosity is. Fast decliners, low peak luminosity. Once you know the peak luminosity, what it really was, and you measure the peak luminosity as you see it, that gives you the distance, right? So type 1a supernovae are a great way to measure distances. If a type 1a supernova goes off in a galaxy, you get a great distance measurement of that galaxy. And they have been used for decades to measure the expansion of the universe. In the 1990s, astronomers became more ambitious in their type 1a supernova programs. And they, were, they began to use methods that helped them find type 1a supernovae on a regular basis. And they were able to not only measure the expansion of the universe, they expected to measure what they thought was that you know, the universe is expanding. It's like throwing a ball up in the air. After a while, it's going to come down. So if you look far enough out in the universe, they thought it would be decelerating, just like a ball decelerates when it goes up in the air. Well, they found the opposite. They found that it was accelerating. So this is the accelerating universe. And these are the people. This isn't a great image, but I loved it because it actually says in Swedish, not just in English, how the Nobel Prizes were awarded. This is one of the few astronomy results that led to a Nobel Prize. It was three people, Perlmutter, who got med, eine Haften, till, he got half of it. 
and Schmidt and Reese, who you would have met here if you were wandering through the hallways here in the early 90s. These two guys were graduate students here. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they shared the other half of the prize for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. So this was the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. And we still do not understand why the universe is accelerating. People have invoked dark energy, which would be the largest component of the universe. But we don't know what dark energy is, or even if we should be thinking about that term. We simply don't understand what's going on here. And it's, it's one of the major puzzles of astronomy and astrophysics. To try to solve that puzzle, we have upcoming programs like LSST that through nightly observations of the whole sky as seen, as seen from Chile, well, they'll really every three nights they'll, they'll, they'll go over the whole sky as seen from Chile. But through their many observations of the same places, they will discover on the order of a million supernovae, many of them type 1A. So the statistical uncertainties will now be very small. The problem is, we don't know how these guys are formed. <laughs> and so not only do we not know what it means that the universe is accelerating, but the systematic uncertainty of not knowing how the systems are formed is really becoming problematic. So we have two models. One model in which the white dwarf gains mass from a companion and it's through gaining this mass that it reaches the Chandra-Shekhar limit. We call that the single degenerate model because the white dwarf is a different type of matter. It's degenerate matter. Uh, the force of gravity is balanced by quantum mechanically generated pressure. And in the single degenerate model, only the white dwarf is degenerate, not the companion. In the double degenerate model, we have two white dwarfs which spiral toward each other under the influence of gravitational radiation, and they merge. And that's what gives the, uh, the total mass greater than the Chandrasekhar mass. So this is double degenerate. And the community has been arguing for years, decades even, is it single degenerate? Is it double degenerate? Now most people say, wait, you know, maybe it's both. But we don't yet have any model that predicts the correct rate of supernovae as we observe it in other galaxies. And there are other uncertainties. Um, so one of the things I'd like to see if we can solve using triples by introducing a third star is can we improve on these models for type 1a supernovae and come up with something that really works? Um, in recent years, 2016, now, so this is supernovae. The triple models are going to help us work on that. But I'd like to take you to 2016 to a different type of discovery. And uh, this discovery was, you know, for us here at the CFA, it was announced in this room, looking at this screen. Uh, the room was full. This was uh, the announcement that gravitational radiation had been discovered. That two black holes, each about 30 solar masses, had merged. The signal of gravitational radiation was so large that it was as if three solar masses had been converted to energy. Hey, come on in. <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> So this was an amazing signature. And you know, on the one hand, talking to a group like this that devotes so much time to building telescopes build, and, and using them, building optical telescopes and using them. In a sense, this is a little discouraging because the radiation that we get when we merge two black holes has nothing to do with electromagnetism. Not, it's not an electric field, no magnetic field. This is all gravitational influence 
these two objects emit gravitational radiation as they get closer and closer to each other and merge. Now, I, I hope we'll have time. I, I wanted to take us out of here for a moment to a website, which I hope is still here. Uh, wasn't quite that one. Uh, I wanted to show you some videos of the merging black hole. Uh, this video in particular, and may maybe this is the only one we'll have time for, this shows you something very similar to what we saw that first day. I'm not so, oh, you're not seeing it. Come on. I don't know why that is. It's a I'm not sure why. It, let me see if I click on it. If, if it might start it up if I click on it. Well, it starts it. Okay, you can hear it. That's the important thing. <laughs> Do you hear that? You're hearing, at the end, you, know, you hear that frequency change? That's the chirp you're getting at the very end. Okay, and that's what we heard that day. Now, of course, it's not sound, right? The, the gravitational radiation is not sound either, right? Sound doesn't travel through empty space. But the gravitational radiation changes the space-time through which it travels, making it alternatively contract and expand, changing distances between nearby points by a very minute amount that required 40 years of development to see. Now, when I first one came into astronomy, I was at MIT, and on Sundays, before I would go into the office, I would stop and have lunch at an old old camp. And at that open pan, I saw a senior scientist named Ray Weiss, who would be sitting at a table, a long table with his whole group there, planning out what happens that day and the rest of the week. Ray Weiss worked virtually every day trying to develop a system that could detect gravitational radiation. And it was he and his colleagues who succeeded so as we go back to the um, slideshow, I'm going to now show you the people who won the 1917 Nobel Prize. 2017. Sorry, it's 2017. <laughs> wow. In 1917, Einstein was working on the theory, right? A century later, we found the signal. And here's Ray Weiss, Barry Barish, Kip Thorne, who you may know as the uh, guy who, who did the science behind Interstellar, the movie Interstellar. Sure. Okay, he's a, a professor at Caltech. Now, what's the unknown here? Well, we know that we have merging black holes or merging neutron stars, but to predict how many merge per year has been very difficult. And uh, discovering some has helped us, but we still have great uncertainties as to the model. And so that's where the third star comes in. Can the third star help us? Uh, so to summarize what it is, oops, I hope this will come back. There it is. What are the puzzles? The puzzles that I'd like to talk about all come somehow from Einsteinian theory. So uh, to measure the expanding universe, type 1a supernovae are important. But I hope this comes here on my screen. I hope we'll see it there. The cable come out. Oh, that's a good suggestion. It may not be in quite changing that doesn't seem to help. There it is, okay. But our models are challenged. And the same thing is true, uh, Einstein's gravitational radiation, the radiation that he predicted that's not electromagnetic in character, um, is something that we can now observe. These gravitational mergers of compact objects are important, but our models are still challenged, right? And so that's what I've been exploring in my research whether hierarchical triples can help us to solve these problems. Now, um, you, at, I'm going to show you a few things about the triples. I know you've had a long meeting already, so you just let me know how much time I, I have left here. Uh, 
I've, I've told you why I'm doing my research, and now I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, let's see if we can come back over here. There we go. Uh, so this is a hierarchical triple. It's comprised of two compact objects and a third star that's a little bit more than three times as far away. This star has not evolved, so it has gas that's comprised of matter. And I'm showing you a simulation that was done by a uh, student, Sophie Schroeder, and a postdoctoral fellow who was supervising her, uh, Dr. Morgan McLeod. And look at what happens with the mass transfer in this system. This is the first simulation of its type that I'm aware of. So you can see that there's going to be a signature imposed on this. And we might be able to look for the signature. I don't know whether any of you are, would be able to see this signature. It's something, something we could discuss. That's an amazing system. Uh, so Sophie and Morgan are some of the people who are working on this. And I also want to thank a bunch of other collaborators, uh, Dan DeRazio, Amy Knight, of course, Morgan and Sophie, and Max, whom I've discussed with you already, Paula, Roberto, Ryan, Julia, Tenley. These are all people who've played important roles in some of the work I'll tell you about. Uh, so now I have to tell you, why do I think the third star does not You know, of course we know that the third star must be there in a significant fraction of the cases, but what does it do? What would its role be? And the first thing, of course, is it's a source of mass. So when mass from this third star comes to one of the compact companions, those companions may be able to gain mass. And that's great. Like a white dwarf would like to get to, well, I don't know if the white dwarf really wants to get up to 1.4 solar masses, but if we're going to have a supernova, we need it to do that, right? And the third star provides the mass. Uh, now, the other thing it does is by sending matter to this inner binary, it poses a problem for the inner binary. The companions here either have to absorb the mass or they have to get rid of it. When they get rid of it, they have to kick it out at the expense of angular momentum in their orbit. So they're more likely to merge. That could help us with the double degenerate model of, of white dwarfs coming together or with merging black holes or neutron stars. And that even if they were going to merge, they, not, they may now merge in a shorter time. And here's something that is really uh, interesting. We can detect this infall. If these are compact objects, the infall is very likely to be detected at X-ray wavelengths. So what we're looking at is a system like this where we have two compact objects. These objects will merge, but the question is, are they going to merge in the lifetime of the universe? Or are they going to merge in uh, you know, 10 to the 20 times the lifetime of the universe, right? How long will it take for these stars to come to merge? And we're asking if we have a donor star in a wide orbit, what difference will it make? And we can have these two objects be white dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes, or any combination thereof. Now I'm going to show you a diagram that I really love. Here's that. Can, you, can you see that? The letters come out? Yeah. So what happens when you add mass to a binary? Well, imagine that it's two white dwarfs, right? Now a white dwarf can become a neutron star if its mass uh, gets much over 1.4 solar masses, right? And a neutron star can become a black hole if its mass gets much over 2.2 solar masses. So by taking a compact binary and adding mass, you can take two white dwarfs and you can either have them become supernovae or white dwarfs, or sorry, or neutron stars. If you start with two neutron stars, extra mass can turn one of them into a black hole or both of them into black holes. So the extra mass from the third star can do an amazing number of interesting things. And that's one of the things that makes this so interesting. 
So it's not just that you're gaining mass, but you gain mass, and then if you gain enough mass, you collapse and become something else. Your very nature changes. Or you supernova. So the take home is that it's important to consider mass transfer from outer stars to inner binaries in hierarchical triples. Because the hierarchical triples <coughs> exist, these processes are expected, and they can influence the binary. What we don't yet know, and what I probably won't be able to tell you for a few years, is what fraction of the time, compared to just ordinary binary evolution, this triple does something interesting. But that it does do interesting things in some systems, I think, is a given. So, what about for the type 1A uh, problem? As I said, with just binaries, we have the single degenerate and the double degenerate models. And what I would say is that mass from a third star is uh, an opportunity for second chances, right? Because imagine that you have these two white dwarfs, and let's suppose they can't merge in a Hubble time, which is about 13 billion years. Suppose they would merge instead in about 13 trillion years, 100 times longer. Is it possible that mass flow, which they then have to get rid of, will cause them to merge in a Hubble time? Gives them another chance. Or is it possible that one or both of them can now reach the Chandrasekhar mass? If they started out with masses above about 1.1 solar masses, when they reach the Chandrasekhar mass, they will collapse and become neutron stars. If they started with a little bit less mass than that, they will explode and become type 1A supernova. So this double degenerate has another chance. Similarly, with this single degenerate, if the mass from the non-degenerate companion doesn't get the white dwarf up to the right mass, perhaps additional mass input from a third star can do it. And so we're exploring all of these models. So these are the second chances that I was talking about. And there are even weirder possibilities. Right now, we're working on a paper where we say, OK, um, nobody's ever considered a type 1A supernova in a system where you start with a neutron star in a white dwarf. You know, where would the mass come from to get the white dwarf higher? And if it merges with a neutron star, it's not going to supernova. So if you start out with that, a neutron star in a white dwarf, a third star in some cases, can cause a supernova. This is a channel we haven't looked at before. Similarly, with black holes and white dwarfs. So the possibilities are endless. Um, what I can tell you is that we have done calculations, uh, and the calculations are important. Let me, I don't want you to get caught up in these numbers just yet, so I'll go back to a picture, okay? In the picture, I'll tell you what we do is we start out with these compact companions, and then we try to find out what the mass from the third star will do. There are a lot of uncertainties in these processes, things that we don't know how to do. We could run a simulation, a hydrodynamic simulation, but honestly, we don't have enough knowledge to really understand how the simulation should work in detail. Our magnetic field active. What actually happens when mass is thrown out of the system? How much angular momentum does it carry? There are important questions that determine the fate of the system that we honestly can't answer well today. And I don't think we'll be able to answer these well for at least 10 years, maybe significantly longer. So what do we do? Well, we do simulations where we make different assumptions. We say we don't know exactly how nature works, but for one simulation, we can assume that this much angular momentum is thrown out. And for another one, we can make what we think is a more pessimistic choice. So take the optimistic choice, the pessimistic choice, and several choices in between, and see what happens. If none of them work, then we've ruled it out. Right? But if they all work, then we said, hey, there's something interesting here, even though we don't yet know the details. 
And so I'm going to show you the results of simulations where we have, in effect, varied a lot of the parameters. And that's, that's the, significant of these, the significance of these columns. In this column, we're looking at systems that will now merge in less than half the time they would have merged before. And here, they take only a tenth the time or less that they would have taken without the third star. This was run for 33,333 seconds. <laughs> the numerical results here are not that important because these triples may not be exactly the kind of triples that nature makes. But the important thing is that whatever way I made these triples, and I, I tried to make the most, I, I tried to uh, select randomly from all of the characteristics that the triples might have, whatever I did, the numbers of systems that decreased the time to merger didn't change that much. It was changes by less than a factor of two for all these different assumptions. In astronomy, a factor of two is Within the noise, right? <laughs> Similarly, for the numbers that uh, you know, the numbers that uh, had their time to merger decrease even more dramatically. So the result of these simulations is that you don't need special conditions for the third star to make a difference. And I won't give you the statistics, but the same is true. Uh, for making type 1a supernovae, for having uh, accretion-induced collapse of white dwarfs. Whatever we do, <laughs> we get significant results. They're not the same for these different simulations, but they're significant in each of the simulations. So bottom line, special conditions are not needed. Uh, one third of the number of systems whose merger time was reduced to under 10% also have neutron stars that transform into black holes. 3% have double neutron stars that transform to double, double black holes. Right? And these would be interesting because to get a neutron star up to the mass where it can no longer sustain itself, you only have to get it above 2.2 solar masses. The black hole that forms would not be a 30 solar mass black hole or even a 7 or 10 solar mass black hole it would be under three solar masses. We haven't discovered these black holes yet. So if we start to discover black holes that are less massive, that might be an indirect sign that something like this works. OK, now let me tell you uh, about making black hole binaries. The uncertainty in these numbers, the predictions of the rates, before we discovered events, was a factor of 10,000, right? Because the science here is very uncertain. To get two black holes close together, these are massive stars. They presumably become red supergiants. They're very far from each other. How do they get to be close enough together to merge in a Hubble time in the age of the universe? There are different hypotheses, many of them invoking one star losing all of its mass, creating an envelope that envelops both stars, and the core of the star that lost its envelope and the other star come closer and closer together as they eject the envelope. That may be the case. But a group of young astronomers and astrophysicists came up with an even more intriguing model where you start with two very massive stars that are close to each other. And if they're born close to each other and they're massive, they are going to exert tidal forces on each other that keep them co-rotating. And because they're massive and they're close to each other, they have short orbital periods. And because they're co-rotating, the rotation is also having a short orbital period. And what that does, if you have this black hole spinning around, not a black hole, it's a star, massive star spinning around quickly, it mixes the material inside the star so that you don't get the central concentration of this heavy core. The material is mixed. Such a star will not expand to supergiant size. It will stay small even as it transforms into a black hole. So they start close and they end close, and they can then merge. 
Mm. Now the problem here, this is a beautiful model, and it works for a certain subsystem, a uh, uh, subset of systems that have low metallicity. That is, they don't have much of materials above hydrogen and helium. But if you have higher metallicity, this uh, type of approach is less successful. So for this, we are considering the third star. And we are just in a preliminary stage of getting these results, but it does look as if you can now have mergers in systems that would not otherwise have merged. So the take home here is that mass transfer can affect important changes and that fine tuning is not needed. That's the important part. The fine tuning. Now, I'm just going to quickly take you to something that may be of the most interest to you, which is that we can detect these systems. We can detect them because if you have a lot of mass coming into a binary composed of compact objects, as the mass falls toward the compact <coughs> objects, they're going to emit x-rays. And so you may have x-ray bright systems. Now, in fact, we do see that in other galaxies. We see, you know, typically on the order of tens to a hundred, very bright X-ray binaries. Notice I used the word binary. We actually haven't checked whether there's signs that some of these could be tri triples. So that's what we're in the middle of doing right now, to check to see whether there are signs that some X-ray binaries are actually X-ray triples. If that's the case, we're talking about ones that would be very bright. Here, this is uh, about, uh, you know, well, let's see, 10 to the 39 is a million times brighter than the sun, but this would be the X-ray luminosity. It would be a million times brighter than the sun's. And we don't need to really go through what these different colors are. But I want to tell you something really interesting about these systems. If you've got, for example, two black holes that are getting uh, to be x-ray bright because of matter coming into them, each black hole is likely to have a bright disk surrounding it. Now imagine that this is the black hole, one black hole and that I'm the other black hole. And suppose that I come right between you and the other black hole. And now really imagine me as a black hole. Let me be really small, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so that light from the disk around this black hole passes close to me and gets gravitationally lensed. You're going to see every time I pass in front of it, once every orbit, flash. you're going to see a flash, exactly, a spike in the light curve. And when it passes in front of me, you're going to see a spike in the light curve. Well, um, I want to show you something. First, I'll show you a possible X-ray spike. This is generated theoretically. Uh, Dan DeRazio and I uh, looked at this both for stellar mass black holes and also for supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. And uh, interestingly enough, after we completed the work on supermassive black holes, someone told us that in the Kepler data, they had studied a central part of the galaxy that exhibited a kind of a spike-like behavior that there, there was a, in its light curve. I'll show you that. There, there's actually an article about this. Uh, it's, it's mentioned in a, an article in the online version of the present Scientific American. Uh, this is Dan, and this is the work that this makes changes in the X-ray signal through gravitational lensing. We computed spikes like this. Um, you can see the light curve is wavy anyway, even without lensing. It's wavy because of another, uh, another uh, symptom of binarity, which is called Doppler boosting, which will happen in uh, these highly relativistic um, orbiting systems. But these are the spikes. And the system that we found, just switch to that, we call it spiky. So this, this is spiky, and spiky actually exhibited the kind of spike that we think it should if it's lensing. Now, you may not be very impressed with this, but if you blow it up, you see that there are a lot of data points here, and that the data points are very close to our model. 
If this model is correct, in April of this year, we'll see another spike. And we're monitoring starting now. So we actually have <coughs> data being taken nightly from the ground, uh, from Las Cumbres Observatory telescopes that are positioned around the world. They're monitoring this. And as soon as we begin to see anything, we will have both Chandra and the Swift Observatory look at X-ray wavelengths to see if they see anything. I don't know if we will see anything. I mean, we hope so. We'd love to have a, I, one of my nieces saw this in Scientific American and wrote to me and said, hey, in April, let's have a flare party. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we will. But I don't know that we're going to see a flare in April. I'm kind of agnostic on that. I'd like it to happen, of course, because it would show us that that's what spiky is all about. But I'll share with you that even if it doesn't happen in April, we know that these systems exist. We know that there are double black holes in the center of galaxies, and that in roughly 10% of the cases, we could see something like this actually due to lensing. Yeah. So if this one doesn't work out, another one will. This is, this is like a triangle layer underneath it. Right? It's so we, yeah, yes. I know it's true. Well, you know what we had to do, uh, and this actually was done by Dan, he had to create a detailed model here and in this case, it only worked if it was an eccentric orbit. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's an eccentric orbit, we think. Mm -hmm. We think, you know, if, if it's the right model. The nice thing, though, is that we know that this model must apply to real objects. And we don't know exactly when they'll be found. Mm -hmm. But the take home is that the nature of some of these accreting binaries, when there is a third star, can be revealed. <coughs> Now, I can show you some more cool things about Roche lobes, which may be what you actually saw when you told me you had seen it in a, um, or I'll show you something. You know how I showed you the Roche lobe of a, of a star, right? And it was just a curve, right? Well, suppose this is the star that's giving mass, and you've got a binary in here. As the binary goes around, it changes the gravitational potential. And that means that the Roche lobe actually changes. And you can see here, if this is a star inside this, the Roche lobe pulses. Sometimes it's only this big, and sometimes it's that big. So it, it pulses and it pushes matter out of the star at a faster rate than it otherwise would. So that's just another result about this. Um, I, I can end with that. We can do questions while we look at this picture. Um, but the summary is that when we consider mass transfer from a third star, it gives us new models. New models for type 1a supernovae, for gravitational mergers, and it opens up a lot of areas of scientific research. And I, I think this will be, uh, it'll take a little while to develop, but that I hope over the next decade you'll be hearing more about this and perhaps even participate in some of the work of studying triples. Um, so I started with a very complicated title and if through the course of this talk you now feel comfortable with the title, I feel that we have really covered enough material here. <laughs> and I will take questions as I run this for you because it's such a nice uh, simulation. Okay, there we go. It will, it will start very soon. <laughs> well, first off, I want to thank you for your great talk. I really appreciate it. But you mentioned that you know you can do simulations now, and you, you did project that ten years from now we may have more information. So what will happen in the next ten years to give you a better idea of what's exactly? Well, that, that's a very difficult question because you know there's a lot of work that needs to be done. The calculations I've done so far are very crude, but they give us a kind of a range. So they're the kind of calculations you need now to decide whether or not this is interesting. What we need to do next is to do more calculations where we actually follow the mass flow. These may not be fully correct either, because for example, this doesn't include magnetic effects, for example. But it takes us a little bit further. 
I think the most progress will be made, though, by identifying some systems that are clearly triples involved in mass transfer. We can find triples before mass transfer, maybe, and that'll tell us, yeah, this has got to happen. And most importantly, we can find triples during mass transfer. So if we find spiky works, now that's a supermassive black hole case, right? But if there's something like that on the black hole level, we, you know, the stellar mass black hole level, we could see that in X-ray data from other galaxies. So I think the most important thing is to try to find real things in the universe where we have mass transfer from a third star. And it's not easy because this third star introduces other periodicities. But as you know, we're all pretty creative at finding explanations for things, right? So if you find an extra periodicity, I might say, uh, hey, I, I think that's a warped disc. You know? <laughs> or th there's a, a cloud in the accretion stream, you know, or something like that. So it's very hard to actually test the model and validate it, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be working, you know, with a lot, paying a lot of attention to trying to do that, working very hard at it. In the dual degenerative model that you have, mm -hmm. does it still need to reach a certain mass? Similar well, to now the other? This, is, this is really interesting. Okay, when I first started in the field, if you went to a conference uh, and you had maybe this many people in the room, some people would be diehard single degenerate people, and some <laughs> people would be trying to push the double degenerate model. Now, the single degenerate people had one advantage on their side, which is that fairly straightforward calculations show that when you get a white dwarf up to 1.4 solar masses by accretion, it can explode. Now, there are some uncertainties there because there's a little bit of a forcing at the end they put lots of sites inside the white dwarf that will make it explode. You know, it was fairly advanced, those calculations. The double degenerate calculations were not so advanced. And it wasn't clear exactly what masses you needed and what characteristics the white dwarfs had to have, right? Could they, they both need to be more massive than 0.5 or 0.6 solar masses? Or could one of them be more massive and the other be less massive? may be comprised of, um, of, hydrogen, of helium, for example. Uh, so at this point, people have succeeded in making some of the double degenerate uh, scenarios work. But there's still a lot of debate in the community about the answer to your question, which is which combinations actually work. So the standard would be it needs to be two uh, carbon oxygen white dwarfs that bring the total mass to 1.4 solar masses. But actually, that, that may not be the case. We may be able to do it under less stringent conditions. But I mean, what happens if there's extra mass? Well, that's interesting. That, that sort of happens when you have merging neutron stars, which we have seen as gravitational mergers. Some of the extra mass can actually exit the system. Uh, some of the extra mass may eventually be accreted again. Because you're still trying to get these, each of the 1As to be similar, mm -hmm. if not the same, at least similar. Yeah, they have to, when they do the calculations that make them explode, there should be a continuous set of calculations that tells us what they look like. And do they look like 1As or do they look like something else? We know that white dwarfs must merge all the time, <coughs> but we don't really know exactly what they look like. There's another thing, I, I very blithely I said accretion-induced collapse here, right? It's pretty clear from theory that if you give a white dwarf enough mass and if it has the right composition, it needs to be more oxygen and um, uh, magnesium rich, right? That's actually oxygen neon and a little bit of magnesium there. They, they will collapse, right? Um, but you know, we've never seen that. That's ne we don't have any example of that happening where everybody agrees that we've seen accretion-induced collapse. Hopefully LSST will change that and we'll have lots of candidates. But right now, even though it's a process that nobody would really, you know, if, if we had people, my colleagues from across the hall there coming to this talk, they'd all say, yeah, accretion-induced collapse, right? But we've never seen <clears> that. So it's a, another process that's kind of mysterious. I mean, 
we have to work hard to make sure that these processes are recognized, that, that clearly they're happening. How do we recognize them? In the single degenerate uh, type 1A event, what happens to the companion? Uh, okay, the companion is supposed to give you, it, it, it's there, and it's right there where a supernova has taken place. So tremendous energy in the form of particles that are emitted by the supernova impinge upon this companion star. And presumably, they will start stripping some of its envelope. So you should see hydrogen from the envelope. Uh, you might also see an x-ray flash when the supernova first reaches the uh, companion. So this is also a, a question of contention. Some people have seen in some type 1A supernovae evidence for hydrogen after the um, explosion. In most cases, we don't see it. Could it be a single degenerate if you don't see it? Well, the answer is yes. And this is some work that I and my colleagues have done uh, where you imagine you have a companion that's contributing mass to a white dwarf, making it more and more massive. You notice that there was a disk, right? That's an accretion disk. You can't get mass down to the white dwarf without also getting angular momentum in. That angular momentum can spin the white dwarf up. Now, if it spins up, basic physics tells you if it's spinning fast on the inside, that's going to decrease the pressure. And so it's going to mean that the white dwarf has to be more massive to explode. So you get it up to the Chandrasekhar mass and go explode. It's got to spin down first. At what we had a, a great PR person here when we first published this. She she compared it to the movie Speed. You know where if, if the speed of the bus went below a certain limit, it would blow up. Well, here it, it's the rotation of the white dwarf. If it goes below a certain limit, it can blow up because it has the Chandrasekhar mass, right? But maybe in the meantime, the companion. Uh, you know, lost, yeah, finished evolving, and maybe the companion itself became a white dwarf, and then you wouldn't see anything. So, as I said, you give us a problem, and we'll find lots of creative ways to solve the problem, and maybe some of them are right, <laughs> but we have to do a lot of observation to, to find out. So, so there's a kind of a way out, even though we're beginning to see evidence of, of these types of things. Yeah, uh, if you have excess mass and it gets injected into the system, what is the nature of that mass? Is it uh, uh, is it formed by neutrons? And if so, does it uh, decay into protons and electrons that form hydrogen or what? This is very interesting. You know, in the case of the merging neutron stars, we actually have seen that. And you can look up, there are lots of uh, papers now in the popular press about the merging neutron stars. And uh, the fact that you have um, a lot of um, creation of elements that were not there originally, in, partic in, in particular, of particular interest perhaps, is gold. So it has been conjectured that uh, most of the gold in the universe may be created in uh, mergers of neutron stars of the material, not the material that has come together and perhaps formed a black hole which we will not see again, right? But the material that was left around it that <coughs> absorbed a lot of the energy that was highly radioactive and surrounded by highly radioactive material and being bombarded by neutrons as it left the area. So um, this is perhaps one of the richest places for alchemy. So the type of thing that uh, old Newton was trying to do and the thing that he was not yeah. successful at that may happen around merging neutron stars, as well as in supernovae to some extent. Uh -huh. So if I understand it, what you're saying is that these neutrons form high, uh, you know, um, uh, high mass and nucleus, high end numbers, and uh -huh. then they form. I mean, some of you know through. Uh, uh, on the beta radiation or whatever. That's right. You're going to have transmutation and you're going to have decay. There is a very nice talk that was given. It was meant to be for a, a public audience by uh, Professor Edo Berger. I think his name is spelled B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E and his first name is Edo, E-D-O. He gave it right here at the Radcliffe Institute uh, last mm -hmm. semester. And uh, 
actually, it, it sort of showed up when I was looking at some of the um, videos for this. That showed up, so I know it's available on YouTube. So if you check out YouTube, the Radcliffe Institute, Edo Berger, and you're really interested in this, it's well worth listening to. Because Edo and his group did some of the uh, work that actually followed these neutron, the neutron star, neutron star merger, and that studied what's happening in the aftermath. Time for some. I thought I saw one more, one more hand up. But, yeah. but again, thank you very much.